Buenas noches. And that will be all the Spanish I will be speaking this evening. I wish that I could speak more, uh, but in lieu of that, I'm, I have the help of Mario, the translator, who has a tough job, but I know that he's going to do well, so I appreciate his help this evening. I also want to thank all of you for coming. I absolutely love coming to Madrid. It's wonderful for you to all be here, and this is a special experience for me to be speaking in front of some of uh, Madrid citizens, and so this is, this is really a special experience. I want to also thank Fidel and Laura and Elena for all of their organization and for asking me to give this presentation. As I said, it's a great privilege. And I also want to thank all of my colleagues who are here. We've been here this week speaking about science. Uh, it's been a very stimulating experience. We are enjoying ourselves. Uh, and I'm also up here as their representative. I am going to be <coughs> discussing parts of our science to all of you. And so that is always a translation issue, not just from English to Spanish, but from a technical point of view to something that can speak to a broad audience. So that is in itself a challenge. I hope that I do all right with it. But they will also be here to correct me. So hopefully in the discussion, if I say stupid things, well, they can point it out, I guess. <laughs> all right, so I want to address one principal question and try to give you the sense of how we as scientists try to answer it. What does the future hold? I think we all can agree that's a useful question to answer on many different levels. So when we think about that question, we might ask, why do we care? Why do we care about the future beyond maybe buying the next winning lottery ticket? There are many elements to knowing the future that could be useful. This is a quote that I like that speaks to this. My interest is in the future because I'm going to spend the rest of my life there. So knowing things about the future as best that we can can be a very useful endeavor and helps us plan. If it's the weather, it helps us decide what kind of clothes to bring to Madrid. There are lots of different examples that we can think of where this would be useful. I want to give you just one serious example from my area of the world, New York. Many of you have heard of Hurricane Sandy. Uh, it affected New York, New Jersey, and the region very significantly last year. One of the tremendous things about our technology and what our science provided us as a society for this particular storm was that we knew about it in advance. We had as much as seven days knowing that there was a strong probability of this storm affecting our region. We didn't know exactly where, we didn't know how bad, but we were able to prepare for the worst in the face of this information. Now a lot of the facts here are what actually happened. It was still a dev devastating storm. There were 72 direct deaths. The total amount in property damages was over 75 billion US dollars. Many flights were canceled. More than 8 million US homes were without power. So it was a devastating storm, but imagine if we hadn't known about it. Imagine if we had not had some kind of advanced information that allowed us to plan for that storm. And there are past analogs where we didn't have that information. There was a 1938 hurricane that impacted Long Island that was also very devastating. But can you imagine not having known about the storm coming? We didn't then. We did now, and it made a difference in how we planned for it. So I want to talk about a little bit of a longer range threat and something we know pieces of information about. There are, a few, uh, there are a few observations that we have over the last, let's say, 100 years that tell us something about where we're going. The first observation is CO2 levels in the global atmosphere. This is a plot of CO2 in the atmosphere in parts per million back to about the 1950s. And you can see that this CO2 has increased from about 316 parts per million, that's about 0.4 percent, I'm sorry, 0.316 percent, uh, up to the 2012 level of 394 parts per million. Since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, CO2 has increased in the atmosphere by about 40 percent. We have that observation. It's robust. We've taken it with measurements. It's something that's well observed. The other thing that we know is that temperatures at the surface of the planet, and
and the planet as a whole are warming. What I'm showing here is global temperatures, uh-oh, in degrees Fahrenheit, I apologize. <laughs> Forgive me. Back to 1880 through the present day. So these are temperature anomalies relative to a long-term mean. You can see that these temperatures were colder relative to the anomaly, and you can see the warming carrying up to present day. You can also see the CO2 increases uh, relative to this record. All right. So we know that CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing, and we know that temperatures of the, at the surface of the planet and on the planet as a whole are also increasing. We also know something about what's causing it. So this is an example of an experiment where we take those observational temperatures, again this is now in degrees Celsius, thank God, uh, back to the beginning of the, the 20th century, and in black those are those observed temperatures measured with thermometers. And these blue lines here represent climate model results, where the models have taken all of the natural things that cause climate to change and integrated them into a estimated climatic variation. And what you can see here is that the climate models match the observations very well until about the middle of the 20th century. There is no way, given just the natural causes, that these models match the observed temperature record. It's only when we include those natural things that cause climate to change, like solar variability, volcanic events, et cetera, and add them to the anthropogenic changes, the human-caused changes, the CO2 increases in the atmosphere, that we can match very well the observed temperature record. So this is, a, this is an example of how we associate cause. To sum these three slides up into a much more straightforward statement, we know the Earth is warming and we're causing it. <coughs> Let me say that again. It's not a controversial statement. My <laughs> colleagues here can agree. The Earth is warming and we're causing it. So if that's what's happened, how do we as scientists think about what the future <coughs> will hold in light of this evidence? So how can science tell us about what the future holds. And what I'd like to do is give you two examples of how we might use scientific knowledge and evidence to make predictions about the future to the best that we can. Is there any way we can get, well, I guess I need the light on me. Um, so one way that we do this is through our knowledge of basic physics and chemistry. There have been centuries of science that have helped us understand the physics and the chemistry involved in how climate and the climate system varies. The basic equations that define how mass and energy moves through the Earth system. And we know a lot about that. This is a picture of Newton and a lot of uh, Newtonian mechanics and, and what Newton discovered uh, many centuries ago are things that are still applicable today that we know that not only help us understand the climate but help this microphone work, or help you use a remote control with your TV. So we know a lot about math, we know a lot about math, but we also know a lot about physics and chemistry. And we can use that knowledge in climate models. We can plug that into these large mathematical models that incorporate all of our knowledge about the physics and chemistry of our planet. And we can use those as ways of projecting into the future if we make assumptions about what the future might hold in terms of the actions we make, et cetera. But all a climate model is, is all of the physics and chemistry put into a mathematical model of a world that's split up into little different squares. So this figure is showing the squares of the atmosphere. We have squares in the ocean, and those squares contain the equations that define the math and the chemistry and the physics that we use to model the climate. Once we do all of the math and physics, we then just let computers do the accounting. So once we create these large <laughs> mathematical models, these physical models that describe how climate changes, we use very large computers, better than this one, uh, <laughs> to calculate how climate changes and how it might change into the future. Now it's not perfect. We divide space into blocks that aren't perfectly finite. We have lots of uncertainties in how the future might unfold. So these climate models aren't perfect, 
They contain different elements of uncertainty based on our imperfect knowledge of how the world works, based on our, the imperfect way in which we can represent space and time with these climate models that are cut up into little squares. So there is uncertainty, and I want to talk to you briefly about those elements, but I want to speak also about the biggest uncertainty about the future. There's uncertainty associated with the physics and chemistry that we represent in these models, but there's also lots of uncertainty about the decisions that we will make moving forward. How will we get our energy in the future? How will we use that energy? How many of us will be around using that energy that we get from somewhere? These are things about the future that we don't know with certainty. So the best we can do is make estimates, decisions about maybe we'll get our energy from this source into the future and we can create scenarios. We can make estimates about how the human population will change into the future. All of those things we can use to create scenarios that are suggestive of different paths into the future. So we can't predict it. We can't say that it's going to be this way, that there's going to be X number of people in 2100, et cetera. But we can make decisions about scenarios that might play out in different ways. Now when we do that, and we look at the uncertainty inherent in the climate system, it has a lot of its own natural variations and so on, and we consider, consider the physical uncertainties with our knowledge of the physics and chemistry that go into the models, and we also acknowledge these human uncertainties through different scenarios. These are the projections that we have into the future. So this is the temperature change relative to 1986-2005. and five. These are those observations that I showed you previously that we know to have occurred over the last century. And this is the spread of possibilities into the future given these different sources of uncertainties and assumptions about scenarios. When you look at where we may end up in 2100, the temperature change that we project as possible is between 0.3 degrees Celsius and 4.8 degrees Celsius. What I want to point out is this is a very <coughs> unlikely scenario in which we actually begin removing carbon from the atmosphere. This is much closer to what will happen if we continue without making any changes. The important thing, however, that I want to come back to is when you look at these uncertainties, the range of uncertainties in terms of what temperatures we will ultimately end up in, have most to do with the scenarios, the choices that we make about the future, and that's a very important point. That being said, we know that should the CO2 continue to increase in the atmosphere, we will warm. And the amount that we will warm depends very much on the decisions that we make. Okay, that's one way that we can project the future, through our understanding of math, physics, and chemistry, and using climate models along with assumptions and scenarios about the future to give estimates on the changes we expect. The other thing that we can do, and what many of my colleagues and I have been doing this week, is think about the past. We know a lot about past Earth history, and how the climate has changed in the past. And we can use that as a guide for testing what we know about the future, for comparing, for instance, to these model estimates that we have. So this is a Winston Churchill quote, the farther backward you look, the farther forward you are likely to see. This is something that we as paleoclimatologists like to think uh, is certainly true. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna give one example of looking into the past. This 400 parts per million number is the average level of CO2 that we will reach in the atmosphere in a few short years. It is also the daily value that we passed for the first time uh, a few months ago. So 400 parts per million, 0.4% CO2 in the atmosphere. If that doesn't sound like much to you, consider this. If a person like me drinks two beers, which is typical, <laughs> my blood alcohol content will be approximately 0.4% alcohol. 0 0.04, sorry. <laughs> that zero is important. <laughs> Same as the 0.04% of parts per million. And that's the point at which the human body just begins to start feeling the effects of alcohol. So that's an example of a small trace amount that can affect a much larger system. It works not the same way, but it's something that we can think about with regard to our planet in the way that small amounts of CO2 can impact the radiation balance 
and therefore our surface temperatures. But the story I really want to tell you is about the last time the planet was at 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. Any guesses as to when that was? Besides a couple months ago? <laughs> well, it happens to have been about 3 million years ago during a time called the Pliocene. And when we look at Earth history, it's true that there were past periods when CO2 was at the levels that we've had presently, and temperatures approached levels that we have presently or higher. So during the Pliocene, at this time when the temperature was, or when the CO2 was 400 parts per million higher, the temperature of the planet, ugh, you can't see that, but it was about two to three degrees Celsius warmer. So at a past time when CO2 was at the present levels, we were about two to three degrees warmer. The other thing that we know about the Pliocene is that sea level at that time was about 25 meters higher than it is to present day. Some of you may recognize this building. It's the Flatiron Building in my, my uh, city. And that's roughly 25 meters up from the ground on this building. So we know that sea level was much higher, and we know that temperatures were also much higher. And this is an indication that this experiment has already been run on the planet in certain ways. And we can look into the past and see what happened with that experiment and compare it to what we also know from our climate models. And when we start looking at these things, it's consistent that the past, when it was like it is presently in terms of CO2 levels, it was a much different planet. Often what we see when we look into the past, as I've said, is that the world has been warmer or as warm as it is in the present. But the other important truth, when you think about sea level rise, 25 meters higher than it is today, was that the world was a very different place at those warmer times. So we as a society will have to deal with those changes that in this case we bring upon ourselves because of the warming that we're inducing through the CO2 changes. So this is what we can say about the world ahead of us. What is certain is that the planet will continue to warm with increasing greenhouse gas emissions and the warming will bring many changes. Where we land in this spread remains to be seen. There is uncertainty. But we know that with increasing greenhouse gases, the planet will continue to warm. What is uncertain is that we're not sure how big the changes will be because we don't know all of what will happen in the future. But we also don't know if we're ready for them. I would argue that if things continue, we're probably not. And how much do we want to work to avoid some of those most serious changes? Those are questions that scientists can give information on but ultimately it's up to all of us to make those decisions and try to reduce some of the uncertainty about the kind of world that we want to live in moving forward. So we were supposed to provide provocative sentences. This is mine. Actually, it's not mine. It was by Nobelist Sherwood Rowland. And I want to leave you with this challenge to think about. What's the use of having developed a science well enough to make predictions if in the end, all we're willing to do is stand around and wait for them to come true? I would argue that as a community, as a society, we've invested a lot of money and understanding to help us understand what the future is going to bring. We have this information at our fingertips. It's out there. There are science work scientists working very hard to understand these things. And we have provided the world with lots of information that now all of us have to decide how to act on. But I will remind you that the world is warming. We're causing it, and we can expect more changes into the future if we continue with our business-as-usual scenarios. Thank you.